one of my favorite topics. Uh, food first, but not only. The idea uh, here today um, is really why at Fuelin we stress so greatly the importance of a whole food diet, the importance of making the majority of your diet whole foods, but also acknowledging that there are definite instances when supplements are important to the diet and when they are going to help you with overall health and performance and then kind of run through some practical examples. If at any time you guys have questions, there's only a couple of us on, speak up. You can type them in the chat if you're doing other things. Um, I will be asking at the end, like how you guys like to incorporate supplements or if you use supplements. So in the back of your mind, you can be ready for that. Uh, I always, I like to start with telling you what I'm going to tell you, talk to you all about it, and then remind you what I want you to remember. So today, the key ideas that you want to walk away with are using supplements as complements to a whole food, real food first diet. If you are going to be supplementing, it's always important to get blood work done first. We don't want to just be guessing or assuming that you're deficient in certain areas. Get the blood work done so that we can target what you need specifically. And then fact versus reality, especially in today's world. I saw a statistic, sports supplements are a $40 billion industry and they expect it to grow by 8% by 2030. I know, $40 billion. It is, so the reality is that between social media, which uh, studies show athletes get about 45% of their nutrition knowledge from social media, which scares me to death. Um, because I've seen what's on social media. Uh, the reality is it, the products are out there. The information and misinformation is out there. And we want to make sure at Fuel and that you understand the facts, not only behind the supplements that you really need, but also the facts behind the supplements that are just full of crap and, and aren't like, I, we want you to be informed consumers. All right. So what is a food first diet. This is something that sports nutritionists and dietitians talk about. And the technical definition is where practically possible, nutrition provision should come from a whole food and drink diet rather than isolated food components or supplements. I have had athletes that have lived off Quest bars. I have had athletes that don't particularly like the taste of meat. And so they have four or five protein shakes a day. I've had athletes that, uh, you know, don't particularly care for carbohydrates, but will only consume them in sports supplement forms, drinks, beverages. So unfortunately, there's some miscommunication and or convenience and or just not a lot of time, whatever that may be. Food first we want you to, we want your nutrition to be coming from food when you can, when it's possible, that's your priority. And why do we want that? Risk of contamination, as I will get into about supplements, most of them, unless they are informed sport or NSF certified, uh, there's that potential for contamination we don't want to take the risk. The reward or return on investment is so low with most supplements that it's just not worth it. Satiety, real food actually provides that feeling of fullness um, and, and satisfaction, if you will, from a meal. Whole food is more economical. Any way you look at it, uh, it's easier, better on the budget, even with eggs being like, I don't know, 11, I saw at the, you know, fancy health market, it was $11 and 69 cents for a dozen eggs, which is just outrageous, outrageous. Um, the variety of vitamins and minerals and micronutrients, antioxidants, polyphenols, all of those come from your foods. And then the cultural, social, religious aspects that go along with eating real foods. So when when we say food first, we, we genuinely do mean 
get the majority of your calories from food. And as I was kind of touching on, the key reasons, and this is, again, what you want to remember when you're going through your day and looking at, at foods, highly nutrient dense, all of the vitamins, minerals, macronutrients, food is, I mean, I call the egg like the perfect little one food package, but apples are the perfect package in and of themselves. They have antioxidants, they have fiber, there's some, there's water in them. Uh, vegetables are the perfect little package. Uh, you know, grains, all of these foods have all of these components that your body needs. The better digestion, it goes along with foods are, our bodies are designed to eat foods. And when we single out certain nutrients or we supplement with one thing here or one thing there, a lot of times we'll get GI issues. Food is designed to work with our body. Our digestive systems have developed that and it's going to be easier for us to digest. Now, there are some conditions, lactose intolerance, if you need a low FODMAP diet, if you, um, you know, there, there are instances when digestion isn't great and that is because, uh, because, you know, there's things that we need to fix in the gut. Um, but overall, real food is easier for digestion. Satiety, as I mentioned, it feels good to chew real food. It feels good to smell food. There's that component in our digestion that really makes eating a pleasurable experience. The phytonutrients, we definitely, even in products that say they have them like greens, powders, I won't mention any brands, there's still a difference between eating actual fruit and veg and eggs and yogurts than there is from, from supplements. Um, better glucose control and metabolism, again, where there's fiber and there's protein and there's fats that helps uh, maintain our blood sugar, helps your pancreas release insulin at a slower rate, <laughs> less crap, supplements, even some of the best ones, they're often additives. Uh, and then the environmental concerns, uh, eating locally, eating, you know, we call them like mis mismatched foods or foods that aren't always pretty, eating real food that doesn't come in a package, that doesn't have to be shipped to you, that uh, doesn't have to be processed extensively, that is better for the environment. So eating their whole food diet is going to feel good all the way around. And I don't know, I happen to enjoy cooking. I think so, hopefully some of you do. My time in the kitchen is sacred. and there's that reward component as well that you just don't get. Again, I love protein shakes, but that you just don't get from a protein shake or, um, you know, a, a recovery drink. I, after my training sessions, if at all possible, I really do enjoy making a huge bowl of oats with chia seeds and hemp seeds and berries. And I find that like the ritual of that very comforting. We get a lot of questions about what kind of defines a whole food. So I've, we've done a presentation like this before and I, a lot of, I had a lot of pushback. So whole foods, when you hear me speaking of them, foods that are not processed and or minimally processed that naturally contain micro macronutrients that our bodies need to function, don't have additives, artificial substances, the easy way to look at it, foods that are as close to their natural form as possible. So obviously, um, brown rice, there's some processing there, whole wheat uh, bread, there's some processing and baking there. But again, those ingredients have been minimally processed versus a packaged, I don't know, low carb uh, tortilla or a packaged, I don't know, keto piece of bread or whatever, like there's a difference between foods that are minimally processed and foods that we have artificially created in a lab. The key traits that you're looking for in whole foods, variety, color, fiber, and antioxidants. If you're looking at something and you can say, well, it is in the freezer section. So that means there was some packaging or some processing here, but yet it's a frozen bag of mixed veggies. If I look at that bag, there's variety. It contains several kinds. There's all colors. There's fiber. 
there's antioxidants. So even though it's a packaged processed food, it still contains those key traits that we're looking for. Gray area foods, again, I still consider these whole food options. Uh, so if you're, you know, teetering on the fence, canned tuna, canned beans, canned tomato paste. I think I see these more as canned for convenience. I could go out and fish and get my own tuna and put it in tiny packages, single serve packages. I could uh, buy, you know, the bulk bin beans and cook them myself. I could roast tomatoes and turn it into a paste. I don't have the time or the desire to do any of those things. So this is where I still count them as whole foods, but yet there is some processing in that. Uh, pre-cooked grains, like the packages of microwavable brown rice or microwavable quinoa. I use those on a pretty regular basis because sometimes you don't have 20 to 30 minutes to prep and cook. You want to put all the ingredients together. Nut butters, nut milk, um, jarred things, jarred pestos, jarred peppers, jarred artichoke hearts. Again, processed yet still in their whole food form. Um, bars, ugh, that's kind of, you know, kind bars, RX bars, Luna bars, they all say minimal, you know, here's the four ingredients or the six ingredients. I think those are kind of borderline, but yet still important in your sports training, as we'll get to. Uh, and then I still count a rotisserie chicken as a whole food, just because someone else is roasting it for me. I don't, I think I've tried to rotisserie my own chicken twice in my entire life, you know, roasting a whole chicken. It's great. It's just a process. Sliced deli meat, again, same thing. There's some processing there. So of these, if you can um, include them, if at all possible, on the bulk and then, you know, not worry so much about technicalities, I guess, is the, uh, is the theme. Any, would anyone like to uh, dispute my whole foods claim and or add any to the list that might be might be gray areas. No, we're good. <laughs> okay. Hi, Francine. Yay, every, all my people are on. This is great. Um, all right, moving along. So now that I've, I think, probably beaten in the fact that you want whole food first, why not just food? When we say, okay, you know, standing on my soapbox of how great food is, but yet also saying sometimes food just, whole foods just aren't going to work. So this is where that why not just food, some examples. Uh, some nutrients are really difficult to obtain in sufficient quantities and or without excess caloric consumption. Obviously, if I tell you to eat, you know, 200 grams of protein, you can do it, uh, but it's either, you're either going to be very, very full uh, if we're not, if you're not adding in a protein shake and, or if you're getting it from things like fatty fish, like salmon or hemp seeds, or, you know, a lot of plant-based proteins excess calories come along with that because there are, there's some healthy fats in those. And so if you're trying to keep in caloric balance, if, uh, you have higher protein amounts or have higher fat or carbohydrate amounts, sometimes you just can't get those on your own without some kind of supplementation. Uh, secondly, some nutrients are only abundant in foods that athletes either don't like or won't or can't eat. So for our, for our plant-based athletes, especially uh, if they won't eat animal products, then protein shakes or these supplemental foods are pretty essential to the diet. Uh, believe it or not, I have some adult athletes that just don't care for vegetables or leafy greens. <laughs> and so for them, having some kind of a greens powder or some kind, again, it doesn't replace it, but it does help make sure that we're getting in some of those micronutrients. Third, if the nutrient content of some of the foods that has an ergonogenic benefit and it's highly beneficial, that's when we want to look, could we bring some of these in? So with something like creatine, 
especially for our plant-based athletes, but for all of us, we should all be taking creatine. Um, it would take, I think, 1.1 kilograms of steak to meet your daily creatine requirements. So creatine you'd find in animal foods, but red meat especially. None of us should be and or are eating 1.1 kilograms of, of steak a day, even if we think that sounds heavenly. Um, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a lot to consume. So that's where something like supplementing with creatine. Uh, the same thing goes for potentially nitrate rich foods. Beets. I love beets. I can eat a, a lot of beets, but I can't eat the, like, don't quote me. It, I honestly don't remember, but for this example, I'm going to say like four pounds of beets that I would need in order to receive the ergonogenic benefit, potentially, I'll talk about that later, of, of the beets, uh, the nitrates that we see in the studies. So that's where something like a nitrate um, supplement might come in handy. Caffeine, uh, <clears throat> obviously an ergonogenic aid, incredible for performance. Most of us don't have access to an espresso machine at mile 77 of our Ironman bike. Uh, so that's where caffeine in a gel and or a pill could come in handy. Uh, concentrated doses of some nutrients are required to treat deficiencies. This is where something like a vitamin D, especially for someone like me who, despite trying to eat a very well-rounded diet, despite getting plenty of sunshine, despite living fairly close to the equator, I, my vitamin D levels are chronically low. I have that and iron are my two deficiencies that if I didn't supplement, and even when I do supplement, if I don't supplement with enough, I am not going to meet my nutritional needs and my body suffers because of it. So this is why when I mentioned in the beginning, the importance of doing your blood testing and knowing what your deficiencies are, this is one of those absolutely important areas because not only will iron help with my performance and my recovery, but I need iron. I need vitamin D for my body to function exactly the way that it's supposed to function. If I want to be able to have strong bones, if I want to be able to keep the hair on my head, if I want circulation, memory, focus, I need to be supplementing with these because my body just can't either hold on to them properly or I'm not getting enough of them in my diet. Uh, next up would be some foods may be difficult to consume immediately before, during, or after training early morning sessions, you, you know, if you're starting your training session at 5 a.m., either you don't want to get up at 3.45 to make a hot bowl of oats and eat it and enjoy it and let it digest a little bit before jumping on the bike or jumping into the pool, or you just don't, you, you can't. I know personally, I need a, a, a good bit of time to digest a bigger meal. So if you have those morning sessions, a bar and or um, some kind of sports like recovery drink. Those are usually high in carbohydrates. So I can, you can mix that with some almond milk. That's where that supplemental food could be handy. If during your training, yeah, I'd love to be able to like eat a chicken, avocado, arugula salad, <laughs> but not practical on the bike. Um, same thing with after a lot of a lot of athletes say when they're finished with their hard training sessions, they just don't have an appetite and it takes them a while. And this is where that recovery shake or recovery protein especially will help because we want to start uh, replenishing muscle glycogen stores, rebuilding uh, that muscle tissue that was damaged, restoring energy, helping you, helping uh, assist your immune system because we know after hard training sessions, your immune system is impaired. And lastly, some supplements, tested supplements can help where there are concerns for food safety or contamination. I think probably the standout example of this uh, is at like the Olympics when, you know, or if you're traveling, if you don't know the food, the quality of the food that you're going to be having, if you don't know if you're going to have access to the foods that you like um, at professional athletes that could be potentially eating um, protein sources, meat that has been, you know, that they've used steroids or anti 
antibiotics on, those can come in contact and potentially cause issues with doping and WADA. Again, far out example, but you get the idea. If, if you're not going to have access to, if you're gonna be traveling somewhere where the water might not be great and so you're not gonna be drinking that much, uh, having some electrolytes on hand can help with that so that you can help keep that balance. So questions about some of the main, and we're gonna dive in a little sp specifically too, but why supplements can, can be important. All right, so when to go process. This is one of my better quotes, I'm quite proud of it. Uh, I don't care for fake foods, but I do care for real food made convenient. And that's where something like a protein powder, creatine, collagen, um, recovery shakes, those kinds of things. Those are absolutely, they make my life easier. They help me meet my protein requirements. They help me be able to have a healthy meal on the go or refuel after a training session before heading to another one. Um, that convenience efficiency factor. Function, if you need carbohydrates, electrolytes, caffeine, nitrates, this is when those supplements are handy and should be implemented strategically. To lower GI issues, if you are, you know, if you, if you haven't kind of worked on your gut and nourished it properly and you haven't had probiotics and you have food issues with digestion, sometimes athletes will say, I can't eat that. You know, I can't eat my five to seven fruit and veg a day. It makes my stomach gassy and bloated. Or I, you know, apples, broccoli, those really upset my stomach or I can't do dairy. So how am I going to get my vitamin D and calcium? Um, which you don't just have to get that from dairy. There are plenty of other sources. Uh, so if you're having GI issues, processed can help because a lot of times they've either removed the fiber or they utilized ingredients that make it easier for digestion. That's one of the reasons that Jesse and Lauren started Picky Bars. Jesse couldn't find foods on to have on the bike that didn't really upset his stomach and cause issues. And so uh, Lauren and Steph kind of worked in the kitchen together and came up with a recipe uh, that, you know, didn't upset his stomach and could be portable. And, you know, here we are years later. Uh, palatability and or an emergency. The palatability factor, again, if you don't like the taste of certain foods, a greens powder might be better, a protein powder might be better or helpful. In an emergency situation, I always carry, you know, packets of greens for when I travel because I know I'm not going to be getting salads all day long. I'm not going to have fresh fruit and veg unless I bring it myself. Um, I carry packets of like those can or those packets of tuna or jerky, or I, I always have a Ziploc baggie of hemp seeds in my purse to add some omega-3s and protein and fat if I am, you know, trying to find a meal at an airport or trying to find a meal at a business meeting. Uh, to meet daily macros and correct nutri nutrient de deficiencies, we've talked about that enough. If you are not able to get, and I know it sounds like I'm harping on it, but protein in daily, a protein shake is pretty darn essential and helpful. Um, and then if your diet, again, excludes certain foods or foods that you don't particularly like, then these, these processed foods or options can help. So I'm not going to go too much into the science of this, but as we're talking about supplemental foods, I think it's important to remind everyone just how complicated our digestive system is. And the reason that just because they did a study that says, you know, one study that says taurine, for example, is that was the big thing for a while, um, is going to increase performance. Uh, and we say in the real world, it's not. Or when we try to tell you, you can do a mouth rinse of, of menthol to increase alertness or decrease the sense of heat sensation and lower what you think is the, out, the ambient temperature or a carbohydrate mouth rinse to help with energy 
um, or a caffeine rinse to help with mental clarity because of our GI tract and the way that it works, it's important, I think, for you to understand. So digestion starts in the mouth when we are activating that chewing process, but also our salivary glands are starting to break down that food. From there, it goes esophagus, stomach, intestines, liver, like our liver is where we process a lot of those things. Uh, it's where, you know, we start to filter the good from the bad. It's where we start to filter the micro and macro or the micronutrients in order to get those into our blood system and into circulation. Um, this very complicated process is why a lot of times in theory in a lab, they will either deliver things in very concentrated amounts or in a different form than we would actually chew and consume them as regular athletes. And so what might work in a lab isn't always going to work with an actual athlete because of our complicated digestive system. So of the ergonogenic aids and supplements that we know has a benefit and in order of, well, at least the first three, creatine, absolutely. It works in men. It works in women. It especially works in plant-based athletes. Beta alanine definitely works in the right situation, usually for high intensity activity. Uh, nitrates, again, can be effective. They're more effective in what we call recreational athletes than in elite athletes. Um, we've also seen that they're more effective in female recreational athletes than in male recreational athletes. Um, the problem that we see here a lot of the time, so nitrates are very sensitive to the, those digestive juices and any kind of bacteria in our mouth can actually change and block that absorption and start changing the digestion. It's one of the reasons they tell you if you're going to take nitrates, not to use a mouth rinse or toothpaste, um, because that antibacteria formulation can actually get in the way. And then protein. Protein is another one that we have seen. Again, the effectiveness and absorption of different types of protein. So a whey, very fast absorbing, and something like a soy protein, um, to casein, which is a slower digesting protein, which is why we tell you to, we recommend you take it in the evening as your before bed protein. Um, to help with MPS and uh, human growth hormone overnight and to help with sleep and satiety. So all of these, all of this to say that supplements, even when they say they work in the lab, or even if there have been some studies that, that, you know, you, there are so many other things to consider when you're looking at a supplement. Is it better for elite athletes versus recreational athletes? Is it better for males or females? Is it better for older or younger? Um, Am I a caffeine responder? How is it going to affect me? Nitrates, uh, when I'm taking them, how am I going to be consuming them? Is it, some people with nitrates will feel the effects within 30 minutes. Others will begin, they'll feel their full effect within two to two and a half hours. So learning how to time all of these things. And the, the real point of a lot of these supplements is to use them to enhance performance, enhance daily life. But I certainly don't want you relying on them. And I think that's where if we know, if you're an informed consumer, like I talked about in the beginning, to know that they don't work the same in everyone. All supplements are not created equal. All supplements aren't actually going to help you particularly as an athlete. They will help some athletes, uh, you know, if your iron levels are fine, you certainly don't need to be supplementing with iron. So a complicated system, the, the human body, which is why whole foods are so fantastic and all encompassing is because they are digested slowly. They're, you know, filled with micro and macronutrients. And then all, all of the other reasons that we spoke about uh, specifically. When you're looking at supplements, obviously you want to look at the quantity 
in a lot of supplements, unfortunately, you know, they will tout, oh, uh, like fish oil. Scott and I were talking about this on one of our webinars. Oh, we've got, I don't know, a thousand um, milligrams of fish oil. But then you look at it and first of all, it takes four pills. And second of all, uh, you're only getting, um, you know, anywhere from 200 to 300 IU of <laughs> EPA or DHA. And so the actual quantity isn't a therapeutic dose and isn't going to do much for you. I was just, just last night, uh, an athlete of mine sent me a testosterone boosting supplement because his blood work came back and he was low and he didn't want to do the things that I suggested, which was changing his training habits, sleeping more and starting to take creatine. He decided he wanted to take these testosterone boosting supplements and I had to point out that the first three ingredients, there were no, I think fenugreek was one. Um, I forget what the other two were, but the, aside from the fact that the, there really weren't studies to support the actual increase of testosterone at best, they increased libido, which he might have been going for, but that, that wasn't the point of, of adjusting his, his blood work and taking a look at it. Uh, they weren't even in the, the doses that they were using in the studies that the company cited. So quantity is very important when you're looking at a supplement. Testing, is it NSF certified, informed sports certified? At the very least, has it GNP, which is the you know good nutrition practices? Does it have that stamp, any stamp of approval? Where are you getting this from? How do you know if it's a clean supplement or not? A health concern, is this, by taking this, is this going to help with my health? Is this going to actually make a difference? Something like an omega-3 or a vitamin D? Yes, potentially something like, I'm trying to think what's one of the latest ones I've seen, um, L-carnitine or something like that. Like, is this actually gonna have a long-term beneficial health effect? Next, looking at, is this going to actually increase, enhance, or better my performance or recovery. And other than the ones that I've listed, there really isn't a lot of science behind any of the others. So take that, I was gonna say take that to the bank, but uh, we're learning more every day about different supplements. And there's definitely a placebo effect of me telling you that a supplement is gonna work and you taking it and you believing it works, but the actual science behind them, there are very few supplements that we know work in all of the people all of the time. Uh, again, the impact, is it worth the money that you're spending? Is it worth the time? Could you get the same benefit from adjusting your di daily diet, from adjusting sleep, from really dialing in your nutrition? Is, the, are, is there, and even if you take this quote, ergonogenic aid, how much will it actually improve your performance? Um, just because someone tells you it's going to improve performance, how much will it actually, what will that impact be? And then the safety. Supplements are not a regulated industry. So if you're looking at something uh, and you know, I don't care which celebrity Instagram influencer or gosh, uh, you know, holistic nutrition, something decides to say is worthwhile. We don't know the safety of those supplements. We don't know where they're coming from. Um, and again, your, you know, especially with something like caffeine, there are definite dangers with those really high, high caffeinated products that can cause heart issues. So while caffeine can be great, and I can tell you to take it in the right dose at the right time, taking too much could be very harmful. So you always want to be looking at the safety of your supplements. So just to provide an example and show that supplements can be necessary, especially for those of us, you know, that are like preaching the, the eat a healthy diet. This was from my inside tracker showing that, uh, you know, one of my first tests, my I think I was supplementing quite a bit um, because I liked the taste of the little cherry B12 supplement or chewables. It was high eating just regular food. My regular animal fish, egg, plant diet 
it was in the optimal zone and then it dropped uh, when I wasn't fueling properly. So again, choose a higher fat fish, potentially take a B12 supplement, increase the amount of self shellfish, eat, you know, for, uh, cereal grains are fortified with, vit with B vitamins. So addressing an actual deficiency is definitely a need for certain supplements. I could have chosen my vitamin D as well. All right, key takeaways from today. Like I said, the things I want you to walk away remembering, whole foods are 99% of the game. Absolutely, they're important. They make up the bulk, they should make up the bulk of your diet. Let's all be realistic. None of us, especially if we are training twice a day, plus long six hour Saturdays or Sundays, plus the transition time from pool to job, plus a regular job, plus a family and or social life, whole food just isn't possible all of the time. We know that. So anyone that tells you to only eat whole foods is just not realistic and they're probably not doing it themselves. Supplement where and when necessary. I try to remind people there are no awards given to athletes that eat super, and I'm using air quotes, super clean or super unprocessed or, you know, I think within the diet culture, health food culture, there's kind of a superiority complex over people that grow their own vegetables and make their own sweet potato fries at home and kale chips and, you know, ground their own almond flour. Great, good for you, but no one's like paying you to do that and or giving you any kind of kudos. So when you have to supplement, when it's convenient, when it's necessary, please do it in order to make you a healthier human and athlete. And then be strategic about it. You don't need all the supplements all of the time. Get your blood tested, see where you're at, incorporate some changes to address those deficiencies and then test again. What you need at one part of your season in your life, you might not need at another. It's not only to save you time, but also to make sure that you're getting what you need when you need. All right, look at how quickly I breeze through that. Uh, let's see. There was a lot there. Do you, I'm going to open it up. We have plenty of time for questions, uh, comments. Maybe I would love to hear how you guys incorporate any ideas for other athletes. Remember there will be people listening on, to this on replay. So the more we can share with the community, the better. Don't be shy. It just takes one <laughs> to start it off. Yeah, Elizabeth, I have a question. This is Darcy. Hi, Darcy. Yeah. Um, so what is a healthy percentage, I guess, for specifically supplementing for protein? Um, I really struggle with that. I was formerly a vegetarian and not even remotely um, able to meet my protein needs. So I, I got off of that, but I just don't particularly care for me. So I'm supposed to get, um, 120 grams of protein a day. I definitely supplement at least 20 grams per day, sometimes 40, um, and like a protein bar is like, is there a certain health percentage that you shouldn't be doing that? Or what's yeah. your great, great question, which I feel like anytime I discuss protein, this comes up. So it's a question that a lot of athletes have. I'm so glad that you asked, especially for people that either don't eat or don't have a taste for meat, fish, and whatever. Um, 40 to 80, again, this is, there's no definitive science on how much protein powder is, is too much. Um, I think the problem comes in when you're using it instead of other foods, like whole foods that you could be using. So we tell most of our athletes at, at least once a day, they're getting in a 40 gram protein shake. So that 40 gram scoop, which 30 to 40 grams at your, especially at your post-training meal is essential. So I would say if you're having that 20 gram scoop, like let's do a scoop and a half and get you to 30 grams. 
And then even from that protein bar or even a, an additional protein shake at night, I try to keep most of my athletes to two and unless they're in that, some of my athletes really are at that 220 grams of protein. They're either just, um, you know, uh, they, their weight needs that to support it or they're, you know, working with some kind of intermittent fasting. And so we have different, you know, body composition goals and protein requirements. And then just on the sheer quantity alone, sometimes we have to do three uh, protein shakes during the day, but uh, so what am I saying? So 40, 40, so 80 ish grams is well within the 80 to hundred grams of some kind of protein powder or protein bar is well within the, the reasonable amount. It's just, let's try not, I would say if you can have tofu, tempeh, um, hemp seeds, uh, edamame, plant-based yogurts, regular yogurt, if it's just the meat that you don't like, regular cottage cheese, eggs in any form, if you can incorporate those and you're doing protein instead, then I would say, let's get some more from the whole foods, but there's no, no judgment, no shame, nothing wrong with getting, you know, one to two of your servings of protein a day from, from that. Awesome. I feel much better. <laughs> Thanks. If, that's, if, if any of you, you walk away feeling better today, this was a success. <laughs> you talk, um, Alejandro here, uh, you talk about testing. Um, uh, the la I have used Inside Tracker before, and uh, just looking at my records, I saw that my last test was like five months no, ago. We'll help. And, and um, do you have the, can you recommend uh, when to test? Like uh, if, I'm, if I'm going through a big training block, I guess my system is gonna be more stressed. And if I was on post season, uh, does it matter? Mm -hmm. Or just uh, supplement based on the results? Can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. We're better, we're uh, back. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I, I have used uh, Inside Tracker before and uh, look at that, my records, it's, uh, it's been five months since my last test. Uh, okay. Do you recommend when to test? Like if you're going through a big training block, is it recomm recommended or just wait until afterwards so your system is not as stressed? Great. Uh... We like to say test in the off season and then test mm -hmm. again, kind of at the beginning, like at the end of your season, when mm -hmm. you're really taxed and you've cumulatively had months and months of hard training and then test again, kind of in the spring, like now ish, after you've had that time off, after you've hope hopefully been treating any deficiencies. So kind of at the beginning of the new season or right as it's starting to ramp up so that we know ahead of time, like we don't want to send you into that training block deficient in iron or B vitamins or D. So let's not wait until after you've done your hard training. Let's do it kind of now before leading into it so that we make sure that you're best prepared. Your body is best prepared for that higher training load. Okay. I just made an appointment to right now for tomorrow. <laughs> there you go. Look at that. Good stuff. <laughs> I guess make sure that you don't eat tonight after seven, uh, 6 PM, depending on what time your appointment yeah. is tomorrow. <laughs> eight, eight in the morning. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Six, six, seven PM. Good stuff. Thank Good you. question. That's a great question. Um, so yes, having some go-to proteins, as Francine said, that you know count and that add up to that 20 to 30 grams really does, really does help. We found a love for cottage cheese and <laughs> eggs and yogurt. <laughs> Any supplements you guys a difference? Um, 
or some kind of like beneficial effect? So I know with me, I can tell when I'm not taking my vitamin D and when I'm not taking my omega-3s. So like the last, I wanted to do, Scott and I have been talking about the omega-3 index test. And so I wanted to see, like I wanted it to be accurate, not with, so I stopped taking my omega-3 supplements almost 60 days ago. And I tried to like not bulk up my seafood consumption, just eat kind of normally, like three servings or so a week, nothing fancy or excessive. And I kept energy, sleep. I honestly see a connection between, especially with vitamin D as well, depression. Um, my moods are different. Like I, there's a dramatic difference nutritionally when I am not taking my vitamin D and, and my omega threes. So I'm quite excited to get back on them now and see, uh, yeah, see what my, my levels come back as have that, those, that beneficial, um, iron too, I can tell, but not so much, not as quickly. It kind of takes, takes longer usually for me. All right. Any other questions, supplement or food related caffeine? Routine. What are um, net carbs versus, I guess, total carbs? Or I that that discussion. Uh, it would depend who you're asking, but what most of them mean on the labeling uh, is the total carbs minus the fiber. Hmm. So it, I think that they started using it to make products look like they had less carbohydrates when people started being carbohydrate fearful or phobic. And so, you know, it looks nice on the packaging to say four grams of carbs per serving. And that's because they've taken the, you know, 12 grams minus the six grams of fiber, whatever. Uh, so it's, it's total carbohydrates in an item might subtracting the fiber. Okay. How you choose again, some that doesn't magically like eliminate the calories from that thing. So I think it's a little bit silly, but I think it also makes some people feel better, I guess, about eating that slice of bread or that English muffin or whatever. It's it's usually on bread products that they use the term net carbs or products like labeled keto or paleo or something like that, which I love that people are, are aware of the fiber content of foods now. And, and I think some of them make the argument that the fiber will help, will help with blood sugar control. And so it's different. Like if a food has 30 grams of carbohydrates and two grams of fiber versus if a food has that same 30 gram total and 12 grams of fiber, yes, there will be a different uh, blood glucose response, but not necessarily significantly and not necessarily in, in everybody. So yes, fiber does slow down your, the digestive process, but how much that actually affects long-term weight is a, is a different story. <laughs> Good question, thanks. All right. Anything else? It's wide open. Okay. Oh, yeah. Hey, Elizabeth, real quick. Do you have like a brand of supplement that you like is your go-to versus, versus another? I know most of them are like unregulated. You have differencing between batch to batch in most manufacturers. So, you know, is there, is there a brand that, that you like are loyal to or... Yes, and, and, and they're not paying me for it. No, I wish they would. It would really help the, the bottom line budget. So Thorn and Metagenics are two that kind of, in general, they have a wide range of products. Um, I 
the science, the company, um, again, not, we certainly don't need all of them. And I think that, but they're, they're large enough that there's a variety of supplements to kind of treat every need. Whereas like for fish oil, I love Nordic naturals, but they only really make fish oil. So, you know, you kind of like can get your fish oil from one and then your vitamin D, you know, from another, um, pillar nutrition, which we have partnered with, uh, that, and they'll now like they're an Australian or New Zealand company. Um, but the feed is going to start carrying their products. I love their magnesium. I love their fish oil. Um, I know that they're tested, they're clean, just the problem's been, they don't ship to the U S. So as soon as they're in the feed, I absolutely love pillar momentous, you know, that's obviously one of the proteins that I use both their plant and their whey and their collagen and their creatine. <laughs> um, so I, I highly recommend them and they have a vitamin D. I like theirs cause it's one and it's the 5,000. Um, and that's kind of, you know, that's what I need every day. Um, yeah, those would be my top, I think in store that you see everywhere, there's that now and OW brand. I think, um, they're GNP certified. They have a fairly good reputation. Um, yeah, those, uh, probiotic that I, I use the seed probiotic S E E D. Um, I call it a game changer in my gut health. Uh, I really like that it's an encapsulated formula. So it gets through the digestive tract. You don't have to refrigerate it. It's environmentally friendly company. Um, so probiotics, even from some of the more reputable companies are very hit or miss. Um, so I would say that's one area that I wouldn't just go buy from anywhere because that, that mix of, of, uh, bacteria actually matters. So another quick clarifying question for like, are there certain like manufacturing practices or things that for folks when they're looking at that, like, cause some of those brands I'm not familiar with, I maybe just not in the Midwest yeah. here in the yeah. States. Um, well, but you I know, have, yeah, I have to get a lot online. That's for sure. Yeah. And that's where it's one of those, I'm a pharmacist by training. So that's where, yeah, it, it's more along the lines of what, what are things that you look for when you're looking at a brand? Like, are there key, like, you know, red flags or, you know, you know, your checkered flags of like, yeah, this is, this is my go-to or this is a safe product. Great, great question. Uh, that's actually, I should now, next time I do, I'm going to do a slide on this. Cause that's a really good, uh, so I, I don't want to sound too like, um, pro pro America at this point in time, but I really do like, <laughs> um, if it's manufactured and made in either America or one of the more well-developed countries, just because I know there are certain criteria at clean facilities, tested facilities. A lot of them will tout actual environmentally friendly practices. So uh, I'm not trying to be Eurocentric. I just know that a lot of, of uh, and I just said pillar, they're not American, but again, industrialized world, as opposed to ordering something online that, you know, if you look, if you dig deep enough, it's manufactured in China or or wherever, or they don't even tell you. So like some warning flags, proprietary blend. I really, really don't like proprietary blend products. I'm not telling, saying that everybody is dishonest, but when you say proprietary blend, you can go, oh yeah, it contains omega-3s. It contains probiotics. It contains ashwagandha and rhodiola but I have no idea how much of each of those ingredients it actually contains. And it's like, hold, hold on here a second. So I'm hesitant with proprietary blends. I'm hesitant um, with if they don't show you where it's manufactured and if there's absolutely uh, no like third party testing, that's, uh, that's just kind of a requirement for me if the label makes any kind of bold statements, like
So any kind of bold marketing claim, I will try to stay away from. And then I guess then too, I like to read the panel and look at the actual source of the ingredients. So I've started to learn just because the product says vitamin C, it doesn't mean that it's the kind of vitamin C that I want. Just because, you know, here we call a lot of things a, a turmeric supplement. And it's like, well, is it curcumin? Does it have black pepper? Because we know that that actually helps absorption. How much are you actually getting? How many pills? Anytime that a supplement says three to four pills make one serving, I am very hesitant to take that product. I'm not saying I wouldn't. Actually, I think I've seen like a hair growth supplement that is four pills. But uh, in general, I would say like, why does it take me four pills to equal whatever this dosage is? Are you not using a quality product? Do you, is it, does it take so much? Did you put, because a lot of times they'll put so many ingredients in like multivitamins. I'm not a big fan of multivitamins for most of us because they throw the kitchen sink in there and the doses are high and you end up just peeing most of it out anyway. A lot of those are water soluble vitamins. Um, I am going to sound snobby and say, I don't buy bulk, which my parents, like they came back with, you know, I told them they needed fish oil and they came back from Costco with like the 500 pill, you know, jar that's like as big as your face. And I was like, gosh, darn. you know, I offered to send you some. And I was like, well, I was at Costco. And so, which if you're not in the US, it's like a big bulk uh, warehousey type store. Um, so I'm hesitant there too. It's like, and I think a lot of times you pay for what you get. Um, and, and I don't mind paying for a quality tested highly regulated therapeutic dose supplement, because like I said earlier, I'm taking it for a reason. I'm not just taking it because I saw someone on Instagram recommend it. So hopefully that helps a little. That is great. Okay. Uh, you can also, again, Google online. Like if you see a product, um, I remember when red yeast extract was started to be really popular for cholesterol and every product seemed to have red yeast extract in it. Um, you can Google either the, you know, the company and read the like Better Business Bureau reviews and or does this, you know, look for some scholarly articles or ask us. I, that's actually, I should have started with that. Ask us, put it in the athlete, the monthly Ask Me Anything Q&A um, and see kind of what the product is about, where it's coming from. Um, examine.com is an excellent, excellent resource, like the best money I spend in terms of membership because they will test products and doses and give you information. Um, and even free, it's, I mean, it, the free version is also excellent. Um, so yeah, I, there you go. I would say be an, be an informed consumer. That's a good question. I like dance. I like that one. <laughs> I like them all. Who am I kidding? Those are all good questions. All right. Well, I think I talked your ear off. I appreciate you guys staying on a couple extra minutes. The loyal, my loyal group. Thank you so much. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully you can take some some bits and wisdom away, and we'll see you guys next next Thursday. Thank yeah. you. Thank right. you. Bye. Good Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.